Welcome to the Fine Print, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Caleb Teske, and today, uh, in a historic first, we've got our first uh, member of the legislature here in Vermont. We've got uh, House Rep from Essex here, Tanya Vyhovsky. Tanya, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it was a pleasure meeting you at the uh, the Zuckerman event there. Um, it, all my new guests, for first time guests, I asked everyone if they'd share a, like a five minute life story with us and sort of tell us a little bit about your background and uh, some fun trivia. If there's anything neat in there, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up a little bit all over the place, but primarily here in Vermont. Um, I was in Essex for middle school and high school, um, and then you know went away to college, tried to come back discovered how incredibly hard it is to afford to live here in Vermont um, and sort of did a lot of work at various nonprofits before getting my master's degree in social work at UVM. So I work as a clinical social worker now, um, supporting mostly youth and adolescents, although some young adults and, you know, um, the I do work with the whole, you know, age spectrum, but my focus is a lot with youth, youth and teenagers. Um, I grew up in a single parent working class home, um, so hey. certainly didn't see myself represented in the political world. I definitely didn't anticipate running for office. I remember um, when I first ran in 2018, we did this front porch forum post that was basically saying like, I never would have expected to run for office. And then one of my high school friends came to the polls and was like, if someone, if you told me you were gonna run for office, I would have laughed at you. I never would have expected this of you. So it was just this really funny kind of moment. But what I really realized is how important it is that we put Put people into office that are not historically represented. It's, I started to realize after doing a lot of organizing work on the healthcare as a human right campaign that mm -hmm. the fact that I didn't see myself represented in office was a reason to run, not a reason not to. And I also think we need to put more people there who didn't see themselves there or who frankly don't appreciate the way the system currently works. Because I think it's never going to change if it's always just the same people there. So a lot of the reasons that in the past I had sort of scoffed at the idea of running for office became the reasons that I did. Really? Uh, Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. Um, How old are you now, Tanya? 37. 37. And if I recall from our phone call, you said really when you ran the first time, um, nobody expected it to even be close or something like that? Yeah. So when I ran in 2018, I ran in a district that had never had a contested election. There had always just been one Republican and one Democrat that ran. Um, so there really wasn't data. There really was this sense that it was a really purple district. And I'm a pretty left leaning progressive. So there was this sense that like a progressive can never win here. You're going to lose in a landslide. Um, but that's not what happened. You know, we ran a really different campaign, a really grassroots campaign. We knocked almost every door in the district. We talked to people um, and we were just really upfront and authentic and honest with what it was we were fighting for. And what we really found is support across the spectrum. We had support from progressives and Democrats and Republicans and libertarians, because what I was really talking about was was fighting for policy that works for everyday people. You know, it wasn't I wasn't coming up at, at people's doors with platitudes and talking points. I was coming to people's doors to ask them what they were struggling with and what it was that they needed and and presenting policies that would help with that. And certainly, you know, I'm, I'm one person. Um, so I can't, yeah, you know, that's a lot. <laughs> I can't single handedly implement all those things. But I, you know, like I said, I lost by a couple hundred votes in um, 2018, which was not at all what we expected. And then in 2020, I ran again and won. And you know, in my first biennium was able to pass a lead sponsored bill around um, social work education and social the social work work or not just social work, but the mental health workforce. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. So Senator Chris Pearson is a good friend of mine and has mentored me a lot, actually. And I like sent him a text message when we passed that out of the house. And I was like, hey, little win for the day. I passed a, a lead sponsored bill. And he's responded back by saying, oh, no, no, that's not a little win. It took me six years to do that. Yeah. So it's would you, not. Would you care to tell us a little bit about that bill before we carry on? Yeah, sure thing. So that bill um, does a bunch of things. It establishes the requirement for some. Um, oh my goodness, what was the language that I used? Some social equity continuing education credits. So really ensuring that um, mm -hmm. our people providing mental health care to people who are 
in many instances at their most vulnerable have some basic training in and regular training in anti-oppressive practice. That's the language I use. Mm -hmm. So that is one part of the bill. It also took some of the learning that we got from the COVID pandemic and carried it forward. So historically, continuing education credits had to be live and in person. And we made it okay to be virtual during the pandemic. And so we removed the in-person requirement forevermore. So you can now access continuing education credits virtually, which opens up a world of options because you aren't tied to Vermont. And it's also more yeah. equitable for our people practicing in rural areas so they don't all, always have to drive to Burlington um, sure. to, to get their continuing ed credits. So that was another piece that we added. Um, the most exciting part of the bill for me is actually a workforce development task force. So it stands up this task force um, populated by people who are historically underrepresented in the social work field. So someone appointed by the Vermont Center for Independent Living, which is a disability rights organization, someone from the New American Council, someone from the ACLU really asking us to hear from people who historically have not been represented in the mental health fields as to how we both grow, but also diversify our mental health workforce, because we know we're in a pretty significant mental health crisis and growth for the sake of growth, you know, is not great. I, so I really wanted to look at that, that growing that field with intention. And that's not the whole list of people. It's just the ones that came to my head. I think sure. Outright has a seat. You don't um, have to recall every little detail. I, won't I think there were like 16 of them. It's not, <laughs> I'm not going to remember them all. And then the last piece was another little technical piece. Um, it asks the Office of Professional Regulation to set up a supervisor registry. Um, so currently, it, if when, once you finish your graduate program, if you want to become a licensed counselor, you have to do usually around 3,000 hours of supervised practice, although some licenses have more, some have less. But I know well, that someone sits in the room with you while you're counseling no so you provide counseling but okay. it's under their license and they are required to provide a certain amount of supervision and processing and with you um as as you work towards I was that gonna say, that'd be weird if there was just another person in the room with you <laughs> yeah okay. Um, so no, not that. <laughs> um, but the challenge is finding a supervisor. So um, I know, you know, I'm pretty connected in this area and had been working in the nonprofit world. And it took me a while to find someone who had the qualifications to be a supervisor and who was accepting people and who wasn't and didn't charge astronomical amounts to provide that supervision. So what I asked OPR to do is when someone gets licensed for them or renews their license to be able to check a box to say like, I'm willing to provide supervision and to consolidate that all in one place. So rather than having to like ask a friend of a friend who might know a supervisor, and I get these asks all the time, people reach out to me and they're like, oh, hey, I know you're a social worker. Do you know someone who's providing supervision? So it really was so reliant on like knowing people. And so I think that's a deterrent too, and, and makes it hard. It's a barrier to, to getting into this work. So as over the course of the next couple of years, as licenses are renewed, OPR will have one place where you can go and see a list of people providing supervision. Hmm. But cool. that's the the gist of of this this. That bill seems now. like a basic and very good idea yes. that maybe we should have done a while ago. <clears throat> yes. Uh, now, Tanya, I believe you described yourself as a, is this a progressive flat Democrat or so, a, a fusion candidate? Could you could you explain that a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. So Vermont's a little interesting and, and well, in a lot of ways, Vermont's a little interesting, but um, we are a state that has three major parties. So we have the Republicans, the Democrats, and the progressives, all with major party status. Um, we also have a law, though, that says you can't run in more than one primary, one major party primary at a time. So many candidate Democratic and or progressive candidates will choose to run in the Democratic primary and then get an endorsement from the other party. Um, so the progressive party, if you run in the Democratic primary, and then you can run in this fusion way where you actually have both parties um, sort of, you know, nomination. And um, it's a lot of people do it um, to sort of avoid like that spoiler effect that a lot of times progressive candidates are. You know, are Which is always the complaint about a third party candidate, right? They're going to ruin it. Like, Mm, I... And if we had ranked choice voting, that wouldn't be a problem. But the way we are sort of the way that we work around that right now is with this sort of fusion candidacy. So I ran recently in the Democratic primary, actually not for the seat that I'm in now. I ran um, for a state Senate seat primary. I won the Democratic um, nomination. So I'll be on the ballot in November. Then the Progressive Party endorsed me. And so I will run as a progressive slash Democrat. So I will be or a PD. Mm. And now... I've seen this sort of play out in D.C. 
where sort of the progressives get dismissed as these kind of fringe, you know, like uh, guys like, I don't know, Bernie, maybe guys with ideas. I don't know. I, I don't not to say I love Bernie. I got some complaints with him, but it seems like sort of some of those progressive ideas get dismissed by the the Democratic leadership, of, at least on a national level. Do you see any of that playing out here in Vermont? Yeah, I do. I mean, I certainly saw it in the House um, happen. I felt it happen to me in committee at times where it was just pretty clear that they felt like, well, we don't need your vote. So like, shut up. Um, I am told from that that we don't see that that doesn't happen quite as much in the Senate. The, um, so in the House um, here in Vermont, there are three distinct caucuses, the Republicans, the Democrats and the progressives. And then there's the independent group. The handful of independents will sort of caucus together in as much as they caucus. Mm -hmm. um, and so I certainly did feel that happen sometimes where like I would be dismissed because I was the progressive in the room, but when they needed me suddenly, it was a whole different story, um, which was really frustrating, but I don't actually think that makes it impossible to really push things. And, you know, I, I kind of viewed that as the role of the progressive caucus in the house was to really push and to really be able to say out loud some of the things that our more progressive Democrat friends felt like they couldn't because they were in the larger democratic caucus. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a frustrating process for sure. But I'm told in the Senate, the progressives and Democrats really caucus together and be, it's a smaller body and it's much more relational. And that a lot of that sort of like party squabbling doesn't really happen as much, which is something I'm really looking forward to. That'd be great. <clears throat> um, you know, and uh, I had a couple notes here about something you did. This was a little bit of a rewind, but you mentioned something about uh, these nonprofits you worked with is Vermont support line, mental health transformation or something yeah 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 absolutely so one of the jobs that I held and some of the work that I did prior to going to graduate school was working with an organization called Pathways Vermont they're most well known for their work um, with individuals experiencing homelessness there are Vermont Housing First organization um I did a little bit of work with the Housing First program, but what I was really there to do was develop a novel um, service here in Vermont called the Vermont Support Line, which is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 days a year support line. Um, so people can call and just be provided support. The line is staffed by people who have experienced their own struggles, who have been highly trained to provide um, mutual support. So it's not so much me telling you what you need, but really holding space and listening and processing through sort it. Of like a, is it sort of like the suicide hotline? Um, not, I mean, yes and no. Um, so the, su the suicide hotline is mission is to prevent suicide, which is a noble mission for well, sometimes you just need someone to talk to. I, I, I guess was my point. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you just need someone to talk to. And the suicide prevention line is really about assessment, triage, and, and providing, um, sort of risk management. And the support line is really not about that. The support line is really about being with and providing support and talking through whatever's going on without as much of the risk management. And that doesn't mean that the support line doesn't prevent suicide. I know that it does. We collect collected so many statistics. Um, I remember a training that I provided to staff. It was a something called Alternatives to Suicide. And the very first thing they said is, you know, I know you think you're coming here to learn how to prevent suicide, you're not. You're coming here to learn how to build relationships and that by itself will prevent suicide. And so it's the, the support line is really grounded on that relational mutual model rather than me as the expert assessing your level of risk. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would say it's a little different than okay. the suicide prevention lines, but it's the same general principle. You call, you talk to someone, it's just a different model of support. Mm -hmm. um, and so that project was funded through the Mental Health Transformation Grant, which was a, um, grant that came about after um tropical storm irene flooded our state hospital and sort of another point oh, of that was, that was gnarly yeah yeah but another point of crisis in vermont where we you know looked at a system that really wasn't working was really harmful and really broken and we sort of made a decision to rebuild it but differently than it had been built before and so the transformation came grant came out of that and stood up a, a bunch of really cool pilot programs and and alternative support programs in vermont and i got to develop launch and run the support line for a few years cool yeah um yeah i bounced around a little um could you tell us, you, you said you were maybe now teaching policy at UVM. Um, how about that? Yeah, so I just, actually my first class was on Monday, um, oh. teaching social welfare policy in the graduate 
work program. Well, from a technological standpoint, if it could go wrong, it did go wrong. You know, I had no internet access. I had no class roster. I had no Blackboard access. They forgot to order my book, but like we got through it. My fundamental- How many, kids, how many kids are in your class? Sorry to interrupt you. No worries, 24. 24, okay. And it's a three hour seminar class. Oh, um, Jesus. And you just had nothing. I had, I literally had carefully crafted lesson plans that I just threw out the window because nothing was, was as it was supposed to be, but we figured it out. And one of the, you know, one of the primary tenants for me in the way that I do my social work practice is, you know, have a plan, but hold it loosely. Like just, so we, we rolled with it. Yeah. I feel that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so you, you must enjoy teaching if you got into that, huh? That's something you really got to be passionate about, I feel like, to dive into. Yeah, I do really enjoy teaching. And I didn't actually know that about myself um, until I got to grad school. So I um, applied for a, um, a graduate assistantship. Um, and the options in that are either research or teaching. And yeah. I didn't specify which I was going to get. But I sort of expected to get research because I had research experience. And then they gave me a teaching assistantship. And initially, I was mad. And I like went to the program assistant. I was like, what is this? And he was like, well, you can change it after this semester. You know, like you've already been assigned to a class, so you have to do it this semester, but you can change it in between. And then when he got back to me after that semester and was like, do you want to move into research? I was like, no, it turns out I love teaching. So, oh. so there's that. <laughs> and, and this feels like a similar situation. I feel like you said some of your committee work, you were sort of assigned to a committee that you didn't want to be on. And now you're actually maybe going back to that. Is that accurate the way I remember yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So I was put on the one and only committee that I had actually asked not to be on, which wasn't really because of the work the committee did. I just, it, there was some stuff happening in the town that I lived in that I knew was going to be really contentious and was going to go through that committee. So it made me nervous. Which, which so, committee was that? I was on government operations. It also just like felt like a really steep learning curve. Like I expected to be on like healthcare or human services or even education. Like yeah, those that's... Like natural fits. Yeah, Whereas right. government operations, I was like, what do I know about this? <laughs> um, but I did end up, you know, yes, it was a steep learning curve and I learned a lot and I had some really impactful moments within that committee where I really felt that I was making a difference and asking questions that nobody else was thinking about and bringing voices into the room that nobody else was thinking about and, and had some really big wins. Um, so I will actually be asking to be on Senate government operations committee as well. I get two committees in the Senate, so I, I can maybe hop onto a committee that won't be a steep learning curve. Although you, you got anything else in mind? Um, so right now my, um, committee requests are for government operations and judiciary. Oh, and that's how it works, right? You said you get to ask for a couple and they pick like whatever one they decide on. Yeah, I don't know what the process is in the Senate. Um, in the House, we like filled out a Google form with our top five choices and like the things we wanted to work on and then any other notes. Um, and I, I don't know what the process is in the Senate, having not been in the Senate before, but I've already had, you know, conversations with the person we anticipate being the pro tem. The committee on committees is, um, the responsible for assigning Senate committees, which is like the funniest committee to me in the world. Like, I know, I always, I was like, wait, is that a typo? No, no, it's the committee on committees. <laughs> it's just so beautifully illustrative of our governmental process. <laughs> Do we need all these committees? Let's make a committee to find out. <laughs> well played. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about uh, Zuckerman. Obviously, we met at the Zuckerman rally, and, and I'm I'm curious sort of um, what your involvement is with his campaign or what sort of drew you or, you know, why you were showing up to his rallies, things of that nature. Yeah, well, I was a speaker at that particular rally. Yeah, it was so. a great speech, too. You give a fucking good speech, Tanya. I have heard this. <laughs> Um, David and David's been really one of my primary, um, friends and mentors in this, this whole political journey. I sometimes joke that he tricked me into running for office in 2018. Um, and so he's always been a support of my, a supporter of mine and, and on so many issues, he and I see eye to eye and he, you know, I can always call and run things by him and talk through things with him. And I just, I know him to just be a good and honest human being. Um, and so, you know, when David asks me to come speak at one of his events, I, if I can do it, I will be there. Oh, cool. So um, he asked you to come speak. Yes. <laughs> he must have saw one of your other speeches, huh? Yeah. Well, he, I think, yes, he's seen a few of them. <laughs> and, and how did he trick you into running? You said he tricked you into running. How'd yeah. that go? It's a little bit of a joke, but um, so I had, 
many times while I was developing the support line and sort of interfacing with government, people were like, oh, you should run for office. And I sort of like brushed it off as like, no, I would never do that. And then um, 2016 happened and I started to think a little bit more seriously about what that might look like. And then I started getting really into my clinical social work practice. And what I saw day after day after day was everyone that was seeking out my support was being failed by our systems. And it started to kind of feel irresponsible to not try to do something about those systems. And if if so many people who had said to me, run for office, clearly they saw something that maybe that would be a pathway for me to fix some of those systems. And so um, as I was kind of thinking about it, someone directed me to David, go talk to him. And I, I mean, I'd talked to him on a couple of issues here and there, um, just in other spaces, but they were like, no, set up an appointment, go talk to him. Um, and so I went down to the state house and I sat down with him and we were, you know, talking back and forth about a race. And, um, he really made it clear to me that there is a huge intersection between organizing and activism and policy work. And like you, like you can really do that work with one foot in the state house and one foot still in that organizing space. And that is actually a really transformative way to do that work. Um, and then, you know, I was, I just finished grad school. So I graduated in May of 2017. And then like by the fall was like, oh, I guess I'll run for office. Um, right to it, yeah. So, but I was really like in this space where I was like, I'm not ready. Like maybe in 2020, I will run. But what, and David was like, well, the reality of the race is that it's pretty much unwinnable. Like because of all those things that I, I told you before, you know, the uncontested, like the fact that there was no data and there'd never been a contested race. And there was this view that Essex was very purple, which from knocking on doors is, is not the case. Um, so that sort of allowed me to say like, okay, I guess I'll do it. Like if I, if I can't win, um, and then as we started going, I remember he called and he was like, hey, you might win this thing. And I was like, no, no, no. This was supposed to be my yes. practice election. Like, what am I going to do if I win? <laughs> Not ready to win yet. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you also about Sarah George. She was another person I was introduced to there. And I believe you said maybe you did some work with her in a nonprofit or in grad school, maybe. Um yeah. So when I was in grad school, um, the social work program, you have to do these two, um, like in your first year, you do an internship. And in your second year, you do an internship um, with it within an organization, really like taking the classroom skills and like putting them on the ground. Um, and in my second year, I did a policy based internship at Vermont Cares, which is Vermont's largest AIDS, AIDS service organization. Um, and one of the really cool things that I got to do was be the representative for Vermont Cares on Sarah George's safe injection site task force. Oh. Um, it was just a handful of people in the room representing, you know, people who provide mental health care and substance use care and law enforcement. Um, and one of the things that really struck me about Sarah is just her incredible open-mindedness and her willingness. Is she still the state's attorney at this time? Okay. And she just she just won her primary. And as far as I know, I it's tested in the general. So we'll get to continue to be the state's attorney. Um, so oh, maybe it, I'm actually thinking back 2015. She either was she may have still been the deputy. She okay. TJ may have still been state's attorney. Yeah, I was going to say the timeline. I'm a little fuzzy on. But... Yeah, I'm a little fuzzy on it, too. She TJ may still have been or he may have just moved into the AG's right. position. We're, we're close. We're ballpark. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I was just so struck by like, she walked into the room and sort of laid down what her stance was and then was like, change my mind, like, help me understand why this is something we should do. And was just so incredibly open minded and willing to like, sort of think outside the box of what you would expect from a prosecutor. You know, that's really what she walked in and said. She was like, as a prosecutor, this isn't something I should support, but change my mind. Like, and she has like, clearly she has. It, like, it sounds like you did change her mind, huh? I mean, I can't, I'm not going to single-handedly take credit for that. No, the, but, the, the royal you. Yes. But I mean, and and she clearly went out and did her, you know, took what we said in that space and went out and did her own research. And, you know, I have to give her credit for changing her mind too. Uh, and I mean, she's really come out as a leader in a, in support of, of um, overdose, overdose prevention sites, otherwise known as safe injection facilities. So <laughs> Yeah, and we're going to segue right into that. That's cool, because that's something I, I've spoken extensively on. Um, and I know you mentioned your interest in, in preventing sort of AIDS and HIV, which I feel like ties into that. Um, and, and this is a touchy subject. I know whenever this gets mentioned, it gets floated in the news every once in a while. Vermont's thinking about doing this. 
And it's just that the comment section is just a dumpster fire of like uninformed people. Like here, here's my take on it. Uh, in, in Burlington, you know, I hear people complaining like, oh, there's a guy shooting up behind a dumpster. And it's like, okay, well, what about safe injection sites? And they're like, absolutely not. It's like, okay, well, then the guy's going to keep shooting up behind the dumpster. Like, how? Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on safe injection sites. Um, personally, I'm for them, although I try to keep my personal feelings out of my interviews, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I am absolutely supportive. Um, I And the reality of it is, is they work. They prevent the spread of a variety of illnesses and disease, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis. Um, they prevent overdoses and I mean, they work and we know that they work. You know, we have seen them working in other countries for decades. Um, you know, Portugal, North, hmm? Portugal, Portugal. Is, Portugal yeah. is a huge example. And North America's first safe injection facility was in Vancouver right. and it works incredibly well. Overdose rates plummeted, the spread of disease plummeted and people's engagement with treatment went up because the way that the, to really do that it, so in, in Vancouver, they've got their safe injection staffed facility on the first floor. They've got treatment capacity on the second and third floor. So people can come and they can be provided, you know, sterile medical, medical supervision, right? Yep. And sterile, you know, clean syringes. needles. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So they're and and they're provided education and they build a relationship. And at a certain point, a lot of people are like, hey, I'm ready to stop doing this. And I already have a relationship with this person and I can say it right here and they'll help me. And so it's also an you know a way of engaging people in in treatment. And the reality of it is is do we want to support people to get the treatment they need for substance use disorder? Of course we do, but we can't do that if they're dead. Hmm. You know, and uh, boy, this is gonna be this is going to be a tricky one. I hope we see it in Vermont one day, honestly. Like, I think we will. I, I mean, and, and what's this quote? Some people say that the opposite of addiction is, or it's like connection. Yeah. You, you know, which which I think gets back to your point about just like having someone maybe there to talk to. Maybe you're just shooting heroin, but like maybe you just have no one in your life and you walk into a building and you have someone to talk to or, and then slowly maybe, you know, because for sure, like, if no one ever offers you help, you're probably not going to seek it out on your own from what I've seen of most drug addicts, you know? Um, and even if you offer them help, a lot of them still won't. But if you don't try to help them, really, um, you, not, it's not going to help them. <laughs> well, and I think a lot of times the help that's offered comes with contingencies and strings attached and judgment and stigma. And so I think, you know, yes, there's this view that like, even when you offer help, people don't take it. But I think we also have to ask ourselves, what is the help that we're offering? Are we offering help that's actually helpful? Or are we offering help that's actually traumatizing and harmful? Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, th the idea that the opposite of addiction is connection is completely true. Someone who has the connections they need and the relation, the loving, caring relationships they need are unlikely to find themselves engaged in addiction. And so I think one of right, the- Let's call it less likely. I'm going to say less likely. I didn't say they won't. No, I said, you said oh, unlikely. I'm going to go with less, but yeah, no, sure. I, I feel your point. Yeah. Um, Sure. You know, so the, the point really being that, so right now we've sort of pivoted away. We have this many, many, well, maybe not that many decades ago, we our view of addiction was as a moral failing. And we've pivoted to this view as like this view that it's some sort of brain disorder. But I think that pro the fundamental problem with that is that it's still individual. It's still on the individual. It's, it's something wrong with you. Instead of taking a step back and asking us what's wrong with our society that is making people feel that's the only way they can get their needs met, that that's the only way that they can feel less of the trauma and pain of living. And so, you know, by building those connections and, and, and taking that, that step back and really looking at, you know, the high rates of poverty and the high rates of, you know, maternal and infant death and the high rates of medical bankruptcy. Like we are looking at a society that is creating so much despair that we are now seeing, you know, one of the many deaths of despair is, is overdose and, and by criminalizing it, we make it even that much worse. You know, so many of the we need to treat this like a public health issue, not a criminal issue. Our criminal justice system is so deeply broken and so traumatizing that we are not setting, you know, when we take someone who's struggling with addiction has likely experienced extensive amounts of trauma, whether that was before they became, you know, engaged with substance use 
or after they eat. I've yet to meet someone who is struggling with substance use disorder that doesn't have trauma in their background. And then we throw them into this incredibly dehumanizing, traumatizing criminal justice system and somehow expect that they're going to get better. And the reality- And also, and also take their money and maybe, <clears throat> you know, and even after, it, say you go to jail, you know, you come out, you're on probation. It's so easy to fuck that up and then you're right back. And then it's just this never ending cycle of sort of depression and- you know, um, it, it's rough to break out of. I've seen it a thousand times and it, it seems like a really hard cycle to pull yourself out of, for sure. It's an incredibly hard cycle to pull yourself out of. And and for so many, it doesn't happen. And not to mention, you know, the other impacts of you can't access public housing if you have a criminal record or a felony record. You can't, it's so much harder to get a job. Like all of the things that provide that basic connection to society are taken away when we criminalize Um substance use. And so do I support safe injection facilities? Of course I do. And do I support a whole, like a whole host of harm reduction policy? Of course I do. And I have signed on to bills to do just that. I think harm reduction is really the way to go. You know, did you, did you take the D.A.R.E. program when you were in fifth grade? Probably. I, well, I vaguely remember it. Yeah, well, they bring cops in to basically load you up with this, this fear porn. And, and so like, look, if you do this drug, you're going to end up like this guy. And I really thought that was the absolute least effective way, especially to talk to children, you know, like, um, and I also thought it was a huge waste of money. Um, really, I think <clears throat> I learned harm reduction very early from a woman named Deb Lee, who used to work at Tri-County in, in St. Johnsbury, and she's a great woman, and I fucking love her. And that's what she taught us. She said, some of you, she was realistic. She said, some of you guys are going to continue to do drugs. That's just a fact. We need to teach you at least how to use them responsibly. Mm -hmm. and stay safe yeah. and stay out of trouble which i thought was just like honestly an hour in a room with her was more effective than a year of dare classes in fifth grade oh absolutely well and so much of the fear mongering that is thrown at you is is not even really grounded in objective fact it's ground in subjective viewpoints and assist and the system of criminality that we've created you know um Yes. And we, and again, we know harm reduction works. We know that that, that is the way for so many things, not just substance use. Um, you know, so not only do I support creating, you know, overdose prevention sites, but I also support the decriminalization of drugs. And it's, yeah, you mentioned um, a bill maybe where you try to yes. decriminalize all drugs, H644. I, I I will trust you on the number there. I when I was an organizer, I knew all the bill numbers, and now that I'm in there, I'm people are like, "What about this bill?" And I'm like, "What bill is that?" They're like, "It's your bill." I'm like, "Yep, still going to need more than that." It must have um, been good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so many of it's them. It's hard to remember everything. Honestly, I've talked to people earlier today, and I've already forgot part of our conversations. Yeah. And I used to hold this against politicians. Like, how do you not know that? But then, like, when all this information's coming at you, it can be very overwhelming. And there's so many, you're talking to so many people. There's so many moving parts. It's just really hard to keep track of everything. Yeah, it is really hard to keep track of it all. But yeah, so um, H644 yeah. Um, would decriminalize um, drugs, personal use dr amounts of drugs, um, which, you know, what we, we've seen in other countries who have done that, that it absolutely, again, lowers the rates of um disease transmission, lowers the rates of overdoses, and actually, interestingly enough, over time, lowers the rate of addiction. Um, because- I saw in Portugal too, the um, 13, like the group, they're always worried about kids. Yeah. Um, and like the 13 to 15 year old age group actually was using less after they legalized. So I thought that was an important statistic as well, you know? It is an important statistic. And certainly, you know, that that is an age group that is often um, very much trying to figure out who they are and what they want to do and can be defiant and like, That's oh, you told me I, I can't yep. do that. Well, I'm totally going to do it. But I think the other piece of that, too, is when you decriminalize and, and better yet, legalize and create a regulated market, you and you put age caps in, you know, when I go to the store to buy, you know, the double IPA that I love, they card me the person dealing illicit substances is not carding anyone. They don't care if you're 13, but the, but when, so I think, you know, even better than decriminalizing is moving towards a legal regulated market, because then we know things are safe and we know that there are protections in place. And, and those, those youth, youthful users are very likely to go down. Hmm. There's a yeah. lot of reasons for it. Some of them are sociologic, but some of them are also regulatory. Hmm. And, you know, I wanted to ask you sort of about some of the rehab programs in Vermont, because I know, like, 
I feel it. I t my first interview was with Cynthia Sebra. It was from Department of Health. She's the director of uh, drug and alcohol prevention programs or something. She's a division director. Um, super nice woman. Um, but like, I don't know. Some of the stats that they throw at me, I just, they say they're all grounded in science, but like, then there's this, oh, there's, oh, the kids will, are more prone to uh, uh, growing up with uh, mental health disorders or anxiety or depression if they start smoking earlier. And and some of these studies I feel like are, are sort of cherry picked where they go through these studies and they find the three little numbers that work best for them and they slap them on a pamphlet and they say, hey, look, this is data driven science right here. Like the driving stuff. They say, oh, in Colorado, when they legalized cannabis, uh, we saw an increase in car accidents, which was true. It's right in the study. I read the study. It's only like 100 pages. It's fine. Um, right under that, though, it says there's no causal link between these accidents and legalization. You know, mm -hmm. and, and they always leave that part out, which really bugs me because that's now you're you're being disingenuous. And it's not lying. It's omitting facts that are literally right under there. And, and I think that's. um. I think that's disingenuous of a state agency that uh, purports to be about, uh, you know, health. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think it's something that happens with statistics a lot. You know, so frequent, the vast majority of people aren't taught how to interpret statistics or how to really understand. And so therefore they can really be manipulated to say whatever you want them to say. And I see this all the time, not just with health, but like across the board with statistics, this correlation being played like causation you know this happened then this happened it's like okay but i mean do we actually know that that someone who used substances as a teenager got anxiety because of the substance use or had anxiety and was self-medicating because they didn't have access to the treatment we need the reality of it is is we don't know and we are by making bold claims like that we're we are doing harm and and i think we can be honest and say you know there appears to be a correlation between you you can know a correlation if you find high anxiety mm -hmm. but that is very different than saying youth substance use causes high anxiety right. like, you need, you need a bunch of correlations to make a pattern first. And then, right. you know, um, or some of these things about the ER visits for children, like the way they measure these studies, say like you go into the ER um, and you're, um, if you have a prescription for Oxycontin, say, if you go into the ER at one of these hospitals where they're counting the statistics for this study, say you smoked a joint and you have an Oxycontin prescription. If you're overdosing on Oxycontin, they will not count that in the study because you have a prescription for it. So when you come in overdosing on Oxycontin, if you just smoked a joint outside, that's going to go in the study as one for cannabis and nothing for Oxycontin, mm -hmm. unless they can specifically prove you've been abusing it, which I don't know about you, but most pill users I know don't really cough up that information to emergency room doctors because they want to keep getting their pills. Well, um, and again, this comes back down to shame and stigma. And, and you know, if if we created a system of care and a system of connection, people could freely, and, and again, I think this goes back to why the safe injection um, facilities can be a really great transition point into treatment because it builds that that trusting relationship where you actually can honestly say, this is how much I'm using, or this is how it's going, or sure. this, what this is doing in my life. Whereas like the system we have now that would just like take away the prescription, forcing someone to go buy on the streets, much less safely, um, is not a system of safety and trust. And we have safe injection sites for alcohol, right? Like you can go to a bar and just pound that down your face. I mean, it's kind of similar, right? It's a safe place where you can go and ingest different substances. I mean, I, I, I safe is maybe relative here. You know, it's not medically staffed. Who knows who's, you know, like, so yeah. Well, we go through a state train. I'm a bartender. So we go through the state, the state department of liquor control training, which is super thorough. <laughs> um i i yes it is a public space where you can go do that I, I think the safety is questionable i certainly you know we know we see huge numbers of sexual assaults in or in and around bars we see people who get in cars and drive home so the safety is is maybe questionable sure well i think a, a heroin injection site would be better i mean they're just going to take a nap no one's going to drive off <laughs> Well, and being staffed, you know, again, being staffed by nurses and medical professionals creates that that safety and being able to test your product. I mean, again, I think, you know, if you spin all the way to the, the Portugal and I think Spain as well, where you can get prescription heroin. Um, so, you know, that it's not laced with fentanyl or anything else. But we also, you know, I think that 
having a place where someone can go and test what they have to make sure, sure. that it is safe and yeah you know use it under the supervision of someone who can reverse an overdose if it happens. And I mean, I think it's great that we're handing Narcan out and I keep it in my car and, you know, hopefully I never have to use it, but it's, it's not enough because people are still dying. I mean, in the last year we yeah, saw an increase in overdose deaths. So we're clearly not doing enough. Yeah, right, for sure. Like, and I don't know, I don't want to just blame the pandemic, but you know, I, I noticed a trend, like when Vermont realized they were sort of over prescribing all these opioids, it's, um, they really dialed it back and they uh, made it a lot more strict uh, the way you have to acquire those prescriptions. And you could see the overdoses from heroin going down and it worked. But then what happened was the overdoses from fentanyl just spiked. It was almost like, oh, well, I can't get my prescription from a doctor. So now I'm just going to go buy fentanyl on the street. Right. And yeah, no, absolutely. Say. And again, that's why I sort of I look at places that will prescribe these substances um, as places that are really investing fully in harm reduction because it is legal and regulated. It's not that I'm going to go buy it from, you know, Joe down the street and I have no idea what's in it. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I, we've got a lot of work to do. And I, I do think the pandemic and the isolation of the pandemic certainly sure. played a role. I just don't like to blame all of it on that. But yeah, absolutely. But I think the other thing that the pandemic really did was it sort of tore off any veil that uh, of of or illusion that we had adequate social safety nets. So you know, I what we also saw during the pandemic is that income inequality got bigger, that um, home homelessness grew, that access to mental health care declined. That so what not only you know I think we can look at the pandemic as sort of like a piece of the puzzle, but it it was all of these sort of cascading things that happened or were revealed because of the pandemic that I think sure. increased despair. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I really look at um, overdose deaths and suicides as deaths of despair, you know, and, and suicides went up during the pandemic too. So I, you yeah. know, I really, what we're looking at right now is sort of a society that's fundamentally failing its people. And when we have that happening, of course, people are going to escape through the use of drugs or decide that this is not for them anymore. Yeah. We have to do better. And it's not going to be as simple as like, here's an overdose prevention site or, or, you know, here's a couple million dollars into substance use trade. Like we really have to invest in our economy and invest in our people and really invest in building a just sustainable future for everyone. Yeah. Even the housing situations, especially over in Burlington, it's, I mean, it's, it's really becoming unaffordable to live in Vermont for, I mean, it's, it's getting there for me too, you know? Um, yeah. and, and it's, you know, along with all the other costs, you got to do property taxes. And, you know, if you can't afford to buy a house, you're going to be paying jacked up rent prices in Burlington. And it's, you know, I, I feel like I'm on the verge of being homeless constantly. Like I'm just like two months away, really all the time from being homeless. I mean, and the reality of it is, is that that's the case that is is the case for most people in the current economic climate. You know, if you don't have months and months of of money saved up to be able to, you know, pay if something happens or if the rent goes up or, you know, I, I'm a renter because I can't afford to buy in Chittenden County. Sure, so I, I certainly understand um, that plight. But the reality of it is, is if you actually just look at the financial picture, I mean, the and, and this statistic is years old now. I'm sure it's worse now, but back in 2020, it was something like 55% of Vermonters could not afford a surprise $500 bill. I feel like so, I remember seeing that. And I'm sure it's worse now. I'm sure it's a bigger percentage. So what that says to me is 55% of Vermonters are one car, like, car yeah, like one deductible. away from yeah. being homeless. One, you know oh no, I have cancer away from being homeless. And again, that really, what that really says to me is, is it's a larger picture of societal failing. Sure. If 55% of the population were to get sick and have to go to the emergency department and would then be homeless, like we have a huge problem. We are failing as a society. Mm. Indeed. I'm going to, I'm going to just switch gears a little. Okay. We, we kind of touched on this, but I wanted to ask you about, I, I really like your thoughts on, on the decriminalization stuff. And you said, you tried to pass a statewide ban on, on pretextual stops. I was wondering if you could tell everyone what a pretextual stop is and, and sort of about the bill that you tried to put forward. Yeah, absolutely. So a pretextual stop is sort of those stops where um, an officer pulls you over because you have like 
a license plate light out and they're really actually trying to like gap, like they're pulling you over because they want to gather more information. So I, I'm sure you can imagine those pretextual stops tend to be pretty racially biased. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've been in a couple myself, but yeah, for sure. You know, like, oh, did you know your headlight was out? Now we want to search the car because we think yeah, you have problems. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a familiar line. Yeah. Um, and so what we were looking to do is take a bunch of those sort of non-safety related stops and say, actually, you can't stop someone for that. You need to, you can administratively like send them a letter and be like, hey, your license plate lights out, like fix it, but you can't pull them over. Right. Um, and the the purpose behind that really was sort of limiting, like really trying to focus police attention on safety issues and really limiting engagement when there was not a safety right, issue. Right. Because there's no threat if your headlight is out. Maybe it's hard to see, but like a license plate light too, that's nothing, right? Right. Like and so we tried to really look at um, how could we, um, you know, decrease police civilian engagement and really limit police engagement for things that are safety issues. Um, unfortunately, that bill got turned into a study, as did most of our um, police reform or racial justice bills in the last biennium, which was incredibly frustrating. Um, so so I don't I don't really know where it is going to go from there. Um, but that was the intention. And I know the Vermont State Police were actually supportive of stopping those pretextual stops. Really? So it was really, really interesting to me. Yeah, I asked. Um, we had someone from the Vermont State Police in testifying right at the beginning of the year around like racial justice statistics and some other stuff. And I asked a question about that. That's actually how I ended up on the bill. I asked the I think it was the corporal, you know, if that's something the Vermont State Police would support. And she said yes. And then very shortly thereafter, one of my committee members was like, I'm working on a bill that would do that. Would you like to co-sponsor it with me? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so, so the cops agreed on it and they turned it into a study anyway. Yeah. Commissioner Sherling was not as supportive. He's and well, and it ended what's up the objection? You don't have to speak for anyone else. I was just curious if you knew or remember. No. I mean, we had members of my committee who felt like some of the things that we were proposing were, in fact, safety issues. Um, they argued that having a headlight out actually is a safety issue. And, and, you know, maybe, yeah, the headlight thing, I will agree with. Sometimes it's hard to see. But like a license plate light or a tail light. And maybe. we went down a whole rabbit hole about covered up license plates. Um, what about tinted windows? who cares yeah yeah exactly okay cool um so that was the bill that we tried to move like i said it ended up getting turned into a study we'll see what happens with it um you know it's certainly something i will hope that, that i will come back to um you know in the senate um as we really try to think about you know ways of creating a better system of of policing and a better system of public safety and i very intentionally use those two things separately because i think all too frequently we sort of use them interchangeably and public safety is about so much more than policing public safety in my view is really about everyone in our our communities having their needs met and not simply about reacting um when they don't because a lot of times i think that we are asking our police to react to things that are really about basic human needs not being met and not actually sure. about and, and that's and i don't often say this but that's kind of unfair to the police i think it is and it's that's, unfair to our communities you might never hear me say that again but you know yeah, that's it shouldn't be their job to, you know, I thought the police were for rapes and murders and burglaries and, and big crimes, not like, you know, like a public intoxication. That's another one that kind of kills me. Like, I guess if you're like sleeping in the road or like pissing on the sidewalk, it's one thing. But like, well, I've seen guys get picked up just walking home from a bar because they didn't want to drive, you know, and, yeah. and that seems totally unnecessary. If you're going to let people drink in a bar. Just let them walk home. They're trying to be responsible. Yeah. No, I, I totally hear that. And and I think that we we really need to do some huge overhaul to, you know, our system of policing, um, as well as really building a system of public safety that is actually keeping everyone in our community safe. And that looks like affordable housing and ensuring that everyone has food and mental health care and regular health care, although you know, I, it, it looks like investment in our community, good education, um, parks to play in. Like it, it really is not about policing. And I think if we invest in a lot of those preventative things and make sure that everyone have their needs met, you are going to see an overall reduction in crime. You know, I am not going to need to burglarize someone's home if I just have my needs met. And if I have a substance use disorder and I can get a prescription for the substances I use, I don't need to, you know, go steal stuff to buy it 
illicitly. So like, I think that as we really talk about sort of these transformative policies and making investments in our communities, what we will actually see is a decrease in the need for reactive policing. And we can then really limit that to exactly what you're talking about, murders and rapes. And like, there will be violence in the world, but it'll be sure. so much less if we fundamentally invest in meeting the needs of our people. It's just kind of wild when you're talking about, oh, we want to police reform. And then you say, oh, we finally got this one issue where we have the state police on board with us. And then it gets shot down. How often do the state police agree with things where they don't get to pull you over as much? That yeah. seems like uh, that seems like a wicked missed opportunity there. Like yeah, a it was definitely really frustrating. And, you know, I, the state police are doing a lot of really innovative things. And, and so if, if any of our police were going to be on board with something like that, I would expect it to be. Um, the state police, but you're right. We don't, as we're talking about fundamentally transforming these systems, we don't often find spaces where we're aligned and like, yeah, yeah usually they information and mm, usually and, they listen to the cops when they come and testify. Yeah. Mm. Right. And so one of the bills um, in terms of police reform that I um, introduced last year and will introduce a version of in, in the coming biennium is a citizen police oversight bill. Um, because that I was think a, you skipped ahead the list, Tanya. Oh, sorry. No, that's that's that a beautiful transition. <laughs> yeah, no, please go for it. That's a great transition. You do you my know, work as, for me. As we're talking about police reform, um, what you know, right now we really rely on the police to police themselves, um, and that is uh, like clearly just if we're looking at the, st the racial justice statistics and we're looking at, you know, the increase in police shootings and like, it's not working. Um, and so one of the things that I really want to stand up at the municipal level is citizen oversight boards that actually do that, that eyes in to see what's going on and what training is happening, what training is needed, what discipline is needed. Um, and that- You think civilians should be in charge of disciplining cops in, in situations where they're, they might be getting in trouble? I think that they should that they should have disciplinary um, advice, like an advisory capacity of really sure. saying like this police officer should be sanctioned, this police sure. officer should be decertified. Um, you know, I think. I mean, what, if I commit a crime, I don't investigate myself, and it's up to a jury of my peers to decide. Right. You know, and and so I think that if we're we're talking about, you know, creating systems of accountability, it can't continue to be how it is now with the police policing the police. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that bill, and like I said, it, I won't introduce exactly the same thing because I've been doing some work in the off session to try to strengthen that, but I explicitly name who should be on that task force and who should not be on that task force. You know, I explicitly name that it needs to have a mental or substance health use counselor or someone that works in that field. It needs to have someone who has been harmed by our current system of policing. It needs to have a human rights attorney or a um, defender general type attorney, not a prosecutor. Um, he needs to have an appointee from the ACLU. Well, what about a private investigator or something? So I put in there that one member can be current or, or former law enforcement or the family of current or former law enforcement. Oh, I meant private, not law enforcement. Well, I... Side hustle. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, don't know. I, didn't really, I didn't really think about that, but I, hmm. but I limited to say that only one member. It does not have to be like it, the 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 board does not have to have a member of law enforcement, but it can have one. Um, to really try and explicitly bring a diverse set of experiences and viewpoints, and again, sort of like my mental health bill, I'm probably forgetting some of the people that I put on that list. Um, but to tr really bring together a diverse group of people to talk about the their experiences of of policing, and you know, my experience has been that the way we create the kinds of transformative solutions that actually work for everyone is by having everyone at the table. Imagine that. <laughs> Um, yep, this, this is going to jump around again a little bit more here, but um, I, I want to touch on the cannabis stuff. Um, that seemed like something you were interested in. I know you had your little, um, uh, the cannabis town hall a few weeks back. Um, what sort of, what is your interest in cannabis and why did you decide to sort of like host a, a public meeting in that realm? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I, obviously, you know, as someone who supports decriminalization, I obviously support legalization of cannabis. Um, and being on government operations, a lot of the cannabis legislation that was moved out in the last biennium came through my committee. So I had sort of my my personal hands on it. Um, and some of the things that, you know, I was really pushing for um, was not having the THC caps on distillate 
um, and um, delivery, actually. Um, that would be great. I got some friends who have been screaming about that. Yeah. Um, and those were things that were, you know, recommended by the Cannabis Control Board and did not make it through my committee. Um, but I also, a big part of the reason that I decided to host that town hall was that as we're getting closer and closer to um, October 1st, which is when, you know, retail sale goes live, I was just getting more and more community questions and questions from my, like my town officials about like what it all meant. And it felt like rather than, going back and forth because I, I spent a fair amount of time on the phone with Dave Scher and with Dave Silverman and with um, James Pepper sort of asking these questions. And I was like, okay, well, clearly this is things people are thinking about. So I'll just bring everyone together. Um, you know, at one of the sort of social work code of ethics pieces is that, you know, when you see a problem, try to solve it for the most amount of people that you can. And so instead of continuing those individual conversations, it became mm. apparent that a larger conversation was warranted to just let people ask their questions and, and get them answered and just sort of have some of these discussions. But also, you know, thinking about going into the next biennium and some of the things that I want to work, to, uh, you know, work towards around cannabis, like a social equity delivery license. Um, I think having, you know, public conversation where people get to share their fears about that and have those fears answered before it's already in the process um, can be really helpful in sort of getting rid of some of the opposition. I think so frequently opposition, as as you sort of said earlier, when, you know, around the safe injection facilities, the opposition is uninformed, it's it's uneducated, and it's fear-based. And so- Or, if or we, misinformed. I don't want to say uninformed, but both, maybe a little of both. Yeah, but I think, it, and, and I think it's largely fear-based. And so I think when you can create open spaces for people to be able to voice their fears and answer those fears, that you can actually move forward much more smoothly. Um, so I've been I've been working with a couple different people who are interested in the idea of delivery to try and sort of make a plan for how do we like have this conversation with the the larger public so that we can allay those fears before we're in the legislative session and proposing actual legislation. I, I saw um, I just had the guys from Vermont Normal on, or it was just Nick actually oh. um, Nick Shorm in there. Um, yeah, that was an interesting conversation. I like that idea too. Um, but I, I do want to ask you about this social equity piece, because this is something you mentioned earlier in, in regards to a different topic. But this is something I brought up at the town hall, I believe, um, because I there was so much talk about the social equity in this bill. We're going to give people a leg up that have been negatively impacted by the war on drugs. We're going to help them get ahead in this market, which I thought was a noble idea. Um, in execution, really, what they did was waive like the licensing fee and the application fee for the first year and then phase it back in slowly over the next four years. Really though, those are the smallest costs. You know, a small tier grow application and, and a license fee is gonna be like two grand, 2,500 bucks. To set up a small, a tier one grow from what I've seen, um, you know, indoor, people have 50 to $60,000 worth of gear in there, you know? Outdoor, you got, now you have to have your own land, which is another huge issue. If you don't have land, you're not growing outdoor. And, you know, if you have a shitty landlord, you might not be growing indoor either, even for yourself on a small scale home grow. So, you know, I'm one of those guys. Like I said, my dad was arrested in this big bus in 91, spent some time in federal prison. Uh, they seized all his assets. And, you know, when I'm looking at what's required to get into this market as just um, someone who really doesn't have a lot of money, I'm one of those guys who couldn't afford a $500 emergency bill right now. And. Honestly, I couldn't even afford the background check right now to get a license, uh, which is four hundred and seventy five dollars. And I just I felt like they really felt sh they fell short, really, in my opinion. They It was a great idea. But really, I, the way they implemented it, um, I, I really I feel like there is not a lot of equity here for anyone that doesn't already have the money to start a business. And with the housing costs and rental space now, it's just getting more expensive by the day. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with you that the the social equity provisions within this bill felt hugely fell hugely short. Um, you know, we had a social equity bill that was proposed um, from the Racial Justice Alliance and others, and we carved out most of it, threw it on the the cutting room floor, and took like itty bitty tiny pieces. 
Um, the reality of it is, is to create a functioning social equity program, we have to make investments. We need things like revolving loan funds that actually give people money to buy those things and get started and have, you know, no interest payments for the first five years and then minimal interest payments that go right back into the funds to grow the fund for the next person. You know, we need to have things like technical support because a lot of times when we're talking about, you know, people who have been historically and systemically shut out, they haven't been provided the the education and the tools to actually access those programs. So it's not just about setting up the loan fund. It's actually giving them someone that's going to help them navigate the license process and navigate, yeah. you know, what it means to set banking up a business and, and banking. And, yes. And and so the, the reality of it is, is it's easy to talk about social equity programs, but right. it's, so nice, it's nice, fluffy, uh, you know, warm fuzzies. Right. But the reality of it is, is it's all just talk unless we're putting actual money where our mouths are. What about this? What if the state used one of their many tax free properties to say, hey, we're going to hook you guys up with some space for people who are negatively impacted by the war on drugs? You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's all kinds of, of possible solutions, but and it is going to absolutely take like real dollars invested in those yeah. programs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I would all, I would like to see us set up and and put money into a revolving loan program that allowed people that allowed people, you know, social equity applicants to have to be given those startup funds. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, paid back over time, but paid back with really low interest. And that and the would be earmarked to go right back into that fund. So that fund kept getting bigger. I think we could also use some of the excise tax to to put in to make that you know i think it's 30 percent has to go towards like substance use education and i thought it was like up to 10 million a year max yeah there is a cap like on it um but we could also earmark a percentage of that excise tax to go into a social equity revolving yeah market. right because the department of health already has an education budget yes. i talked to cynthia she was my first guest she told me the size of her budget and it's about 65 million dollars i think you know that's you can print plenty of pamphlets and Make I mean, and I think some of that, you know, education money might be better spent, honestly, on harm reduction and on counseling and on substance use services and on overdose prevention sites and, you know, and really investing in the harm reduction services that we need in our communities. Let me ask you this, because this was a great point someone raised to me. I believe it was um, Tim Fair, uh, Vermont Cannabis Solutions. He said, um, what about the social equity for, and I'm paraphrasing here, but um, what about the social equity for um, people who were negatively impacted by the war on drugs, who don't want anything to do with the cannabis industry? You know, this is something that's negatively impacted your life. Not not every person who's been negatively impacted by the war on drugs is going to be super eager to jump into an industry that has negatively impacted their life. So what about all the other people who don't want anything to do with selling weed um, that were also negatively impacted? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really valid question and a really good point that I don't feel like I'm equipped to answer because I yeah, wasn't. Tim, you negatively... got me on that one too. I was like, well, Shit, that's a good I wasn't negatively impacted, you know. And and like I said before, I think that the the place to get that answer is from the people who were, you know, to really ask, like, to really recognize, like, first of all, first and foremost, I think we need to expunge all cannabis records. That's a that's um, a no brainer. You know, just get rid of them. Like if if you were arrested for something that's no longer illegal, it disappears. It right. just goes away. Something black. that the state is now going to make money off selling. Right. Um, you know, so I, I, so there's that piece, but I I don't know that that's enough, and I don't know that I feel like I am qualified to say what is enough because I wasn't personally harmed by that. I mean, I'm sure that in some, you know, we were I all harmed some, by the war. I got some drugs. ideas. Great. What are they? <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk after this. That could be a long list. We've got about 20 minutes left, so I, I could take all day. And, and I see you got a, a endorsement here from uh, Vermont Growers Association. Yeah, that was a surprise. Yeah. How do you, how do you know Jeff? Um, I don't, actually. So he you came don't. to the Cannabis Town Hall oh, and cool. reached out afterwards wanting to chat about a possible endorsement. So I guess, awesome. you know, what I what I shared and said there made it clear that I was um, really supportive of, uh, of our moving forward with a strong, you know, growing market and a strong retail market here in Vermont in a way that is is really grounded in, in again, justice and s sustainability. Well, I told him to talk to you after our Zuckerman meeting. I was like, hey, maybe you want to talk to Tanya. She had some interesting ideas about drug policy. 
Yeah. Well, and then I did the cannabis town hall just like a week or so later. Yeah. They they were there and they reached out to me the next day. Yeah. Awesome. I like Jeff. He's a good guy. Mm. Now, boy, we're getting towards the end here. I want to talk about healthcare for a minute because I okay. saw your post yesterday on Instagram and I don't want you to, you don't have to disclose a lot of medical details if you don't want, but I was really um, kind of intrigued by your story and I was curious if you would share sort of what you've been going through. Yeah, absolutely. So healthcare is really the issue, the issue that I cut my teeth on. So when I graduated college, it was before the Affordable Care Act and I was uninsurable due to pre-existing conditions. And I found myself in the position on more than one occasion of, of like, am I going to go to the emergency department because of this health thing coming up? Or am I going to pay my rent this month? Cause I can't do both. Um, which got me involved in the healthcare in, in my first work organizing on the healthcare as a human right campaign, um, which was working to create, to make, um, healthcare a public good in the state of Vermont. And in 2011, Act 48 was passed, which says that healthcare is a public good in the state of Vermont. However, it's an unfunded mandate that's never been realized because here we are 11 years later and healthcare is definitely not a public good. Um, and so for me, like healthcare was the foundational policy that really got me involved in political action and got me sort of into policymaking spaces, recognizing how incredibly broken the system was. The Affordable Care Act made it so that I could have insurance, um, which is great. It, it sort of, you know, has prevented me from dying, but it hasn't prevented me from racking up medical debt. It hasn't prevented me from having to make the choice of can I actually afford this medical care that I need? Um, because frankly, the Affordable Care Act is not what we need. What we need is a system of universal health care where, where health care is a public good, like every other developed nation in the, in right. the world. And, um, so, and the argument, so the counter argument to that is like, oh, it's going to increase our taxes. It's like our taxes seem like they're already pretty goddamn high. And well, so, so I would pay marginally more for better health care. Yes. And so here's the thing that, that is left out of that conversation, though. So um, when and this is a couple years old now, but I think it was, you know, 2019, maybe 2020, um, a, you know, Senator Sanders introduced a Medicare for All Act that included um, tra retraining all of the people like in the insurance industry that would lose their job under universal health care. And it was an estimated 4% payroll tax on income over $29,000. Um, and when you do the math, like for my family, when I look at what I pay out of pocket versus that 4% tax, I'm bringing home significantly more money. Yes, I'm paying a slightly higher tax, but I'm no longer paying $1,100 a month in insurance premiums and $16,000 out of pocket maximums and $50 copays here. $16, and $1,500. Yes. Um, That's ridiculous. So so the reality of it is, is like, you're only getting half the story when people say, oh, well, your taxes would go up. Sure, my taxes would go up, but what I'm paying into our messed up system now would go down. And the math, other- Math is hard, Tanya. Math is hard, <laughs> especially if you only have half the equation. Yeah, right. <laughs> piece of that too is that like, it is estimated that a full one third of our healthcare costs are in administration, which is those insurance organizations, like the the- the people who wouldn't be needed if we had a universal system. And so from a patient who has had health conditions from all of my life, I have struggled without the ACA. I've struggled with the ACA. Um, you know, and I think some of the other counter arguments to socialized healthcare are like, what about substandard service? What about not being able to get the healthcare that you need because you're like rejected from the doctor's office? Or what about long wait times? And and so my that Instagram post really sort of named all of that. So here we are in today's world of private healthcare, which shouldn't be a thing. Um I have health insurance. I have a master's degree. I've done all the things you're supposed to do to like get by in the world, but I happened to be born with some health conditions um, and have spent a couple of decades trying to get answers to these weird health conditions. And yeah. sometimes I didn't have insurance, so it all had to get put on hold. And sometimes I couldn't afford the, the, the medical care, so it all had to get put on hold. And the other piece of it too is, you know, I think we have an over-reliance on specialists who only treat one system and don't look at the whole, which also I think when you have a sort of rare systemic issue can delay treatment. We also have a lot sure. of sexism and racism and other problems within our health system that sure. make it that make it harder for women to get diagnosed, diagnosed and make it harder for people of color to get diagnosed. So there's a whole lot happening here. But from a strict standpoint of like the need for universal health care, even with my insurance, 
and you know all of the concerns about socialized medicine creating problems like i finally ended up at a clinic in boston that i had to be accepted to which meant they could have rejected me they could have been like nope so here's the first one like we have our, this private system and it can reject you as a patient um the next Sorry. the next piece once being accepted was the very first question they they that we asked was like, well, we have to find out if your insurance is going to cover it. Cause if not, like you have to pay for it and it's like astronomically expensive. So here we are, you know, here's like, they've said, yes, we recognize you really do need this super specialized healthcare, but you might not be able to afford it. So I was lucky. Like in that dangling way. that carrot in front right. of your face. Like, so I was lucky that my insurance did cover it. Um, and then I sat on a wait list for 19 months before they had a, an appointment. To yes. Holy I was shit. referred to this clinic in November of 2020 and I had an appointment earlier this week. So we're talking about long wait times with like a universal health care, but you're already waiting 19 fucking months to see a specialist. The longest I've heard from any, and, and I, I have plenty of friends who live in, in countries with universal, you know, health care. And the longest I've heard for elective procedures in some of those countries is like six months. Yeah, right. So here I am for like life saving care waiting almost two years. Wow. Um, and that's under this system. And then I get there and like, yes, they think they they figured out what's going on for real, but they need to do lab work. But my insurance doesn't cover the hospital's lab. So they're going to write it all out. I can bring it back to Vermont, make an appointment here to get the lab work done, then sent to them, which is going to take weeks further delaying care. Wow. Um, that, hurt, that hurt my head to listen to, Tanya. God damn. <laughs> and then. Here's this treatment option, and the average out of patient out of pocket cost after insurance is fifteen thousand dollars a year. So our like our system doesn't work. Hey, and have you tried being poor? Because Vermont Medicaid is fantastic. Well, unfortunately, I am not poor enough. <laughs> well, try harder, Tanya. But I did introduce a bill um, last <laughs> year that would actually phase in Vermont Medicaid for every Vermonter. So it would start by expanding Dr. Dinosaur to all pe all children under 21, regardless of income, and everyone from 55 to Medicare age. And then over the course of the next few years would close the gap between the people who are on the older end of the spectrum and people on the younger end of the spectrum, and eventually would cover every Vermonter with Dr. Dinosaur Medicaid. You know, there's been times in my life, honestly, where I didn't even want to go out where I've been unemployed employed and I got that Medicaid because I have psoriatic arthritis. I have to take Humira twice a month and methotrexate. And I'm like, boy, I don't, part of me doesn't even want to go get a job now. Cause as soon as I get a job, I'm going to be busting my ass just to dump a bunch of that money back into a super expensive healthcare plan through my employer. And honestly, I'm going to be working for, for not much money. Like, I, honestly, I, sometimes I feel like I'd rather be broke and not have to work some shitty job and have good insurance than have to go bend over backwards for someone just to barely scrape by. Yeah, it's it's definitely really hard. And I mean, the other sad reality of it is, is people stay in terrible jobs. I've stayed in terrible jobs because I had good insurance. People stay what? in terrible abusive relationships because of insurance. Like the reality of-, of That's so sad. That's fucking sad. Insurance and economic system is that it's keeping people stuck in horrific situations. And, and it's all under this sort of guise of freedom. Freedom to what? Pay or die? Like it's like- no, you're not free if you're trapped in an abusive relationship because of health insurance. You're not free if you're trapped in a crappy job because of health insurance. Like, that's not freedom. Fucking hey, Tanya. We're going to be friends one day, I think. Well, I, I, want, I, I got a couple more notes here. One, this was a story I just read yesterday uh, uh, about um, Jennifer Barrett. You know her? She's a judge. She was just appointed to the Superior Court. Okay. Um, I, I thought this was an interesting story because um, apparently she was appointed a little early and now whoever she was the Orleans County state's attorney, I believe. And so if her seat gets vacated to appoint her as a superior court judge from the reading of this um, seven days story or Vermont digger, sorry, it said that Phil Scott would then be able to appoint a replacement for the Orleans County um, state's attorney or district attorney or whatever. Um, and, and that they would get to stay for the next four years, which I found to be odd because don't we usually vote on those kind of positions? We do usually vote on those positions, but anytime there's a vacancy due to someone moving into a different office or resigning, it, it is in our constitution that that is an appointment until the next regular election cycle. Um, that's actually how Sarah George ended up as the Chittenden County State's attorney as she was appointed when TJ became the attorney general. 
Hmm. So, huh, interesting. I just thought it was odd timing. Yeah. With the election coming up after the primaries, suddenly we're going to promote this judge and then maybe slide one of our own judges in over one of my appointees. I, I don't know. It felt weird to me. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly you know the timing gives me pause as well and and certainly in this in this world of of you know lack of trust in in all kinds of systems i think it's easy to look at that and be like hey is this like some sort of calculated thing that happened and i think it it could have just happened that way you know but that is we had a handful of resignations in the house in the last biennium and that that was the process as well of of putting oh so some um, of the signs they also the governor yeah, also so gets to a okay and usually the way that that process works is whatever party the person who resigned was from the the town committee for that party gets to put forward three names of people they would like to see and the governor chooses from that list of names although he is not obligated to do to stick within the party or ob like it's customary that he you know if a democrat resigns he appoints a democrat sure. um, and if a republican resigns he appoints a republican but he does not have to okay. um, it's also customary that he works with the town um committee to to name some people but he does not have to okay um so that is the that is sort of the process um for a resignation as well as the governor gets to make an appointment cool. to fill out the remainder of the term Cool. So if the state's attorney's term is four years, then that is that would be filling out the remainder of that term. Mm, thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I, I don't understand government operations. This, in in a way, this project has sort of been a learning experience for me to understand how this shit works as well. I think part of the reason we have such low engagement and that our systems are so homogeneously like the same people always in the same seats is because people don't understand government. I am really hoping to work with um, some fellow members of the Senate and some national organizations to implement some national, uh, some mandatory civics requirements mm -hmm. for, for our, our K-12 students, because I think that the people who get the education about how the system works are the people who have the privilege to have people within the system that know how the system works and it sort of creates this cycle. So for me, it's an equity issue to make sure that everyone knows how the system works and everyone knows how to be engaged with the system. Right. And if you don't, that's something that might take you a while. To, like you said, there's a steep learning curve. So maybe if we taught kids at a young age, they would have more time to sort of gradually absorb that. And by the time it comes down to running for office, they have everything they need. Like they're not just getting thrown, like I'm going to run for office and I have no idea how any of this works you know uh, and i thought that was a, a great idea that you brought up and once again you stole my note there i was gonna say that <laughs> but i thought that was a great it's idea a natural yeah, segue. Mm. yeah and uh, also taxes they should teach the kids how to do taxes and grow yeah. vegetables you know i i learned how to do my taxes i think it was like freshman year in high school in like social studies class really? we did mock tax yes. damn we didn't do that Goddamn. In social studies. I figured that would be more of a math ex exercise there. Make the, the <laughs> argument in either either direction. <laughs> All right. Cool. I, there was one other question, and this is winding back, too. I wanted to ask you about uh, police lawsuits, uh, just to get back to that for one second, and then I'm going to give you the last word before we get out of here. But I'm curious, say a cop got arrested for murdering a guy. Or maybe that's a bad example. Something that's not a criminal offense, but that the the city could get sued for, or the town could get sued for. When that happens, um, I have a few questions. Who who defends the police officers in court? Do you know that? Um, I mean, they have the right to a lawyer. Um, a lot of times, the the police unions can provide that. Um, but you, they can use whoever, whatever lawyer that they would like to use. I was just reading about a lawsuit with this cop back from 2000. Well, it just got settled a couple of years ago, but it's from 2014. It said that maybe the um, assistant attorney general was defending it. He's on the, this article, like speaking out like this guy was he was fired from his job for conducting illegal searches on the roadside. He strip searched two people on separate occasions on the side of the road while cars were driving by. Um, he was also removed for. Um, some racial profiling. Um, and I, I'm just wondering who defends those guys Do, are the tech like, and who pays the settlement? Where does the settlement money come from when a police officer is found, uh, you know, loses one of these lawsuits? Um, that depends. 
um, on state and, lo and local law. You, a lot of times it comes from the police force, which is paid for with taxpayer dollars, but we could make it so that it came individually from the officer. That's that's something within our power to do. It's And that's, you know, as, as we were starting to have conversations around qualified immunity in the last biennium, those are some of the things that were coming up. And, and I think that part of the reason the qualified immunity bill got turned into a study um, was because there were a lot of these really complex questions that came up around like who would defend and who's going to pay it. And, and um, because right now it's pretty uncommon that, that there is a settlement um, for police misconduct. It doesn't sure. happen very often. Right. Um, and it's hard is, to get, it's hard to even get it in court, let alone right. win a settlement, you know? Right. And so a lot of these questions haven't really come up because they haven't really been an issue because there hasn't been the kind of accountability that we're really talking about. And I think that those are some of the reasons that as they were talking about like the qualified immunity bill, that was a question that came up. Like if we take away qualified immunity and more cops are getting sued, who's going to pay the settlements? And, and those are questions that need to be answered. But the, the answer is that's up to us who we, you know, do we say that it's the taxpayers or the department? What if, I mean, yeah, or? if the department has to pay, obviously that's coming out of taxpayer money. But even if you sued a cop as an individual, his salary is paid with taxpayer money. So technically they're kind of just paying you with your own money. And, and I feel like that sort of absolves them of really, not absolves them but really like if you gave me ten thousand dollars and told me to go to the casino like i wouldn't be too worried about losing it you know mm -hmm. like you know if i took my own ten thousand dollars to the casino i might be a little more careful because i you know um do you think maybe um requiring police to to pay these settlements would um cause them to sort of think twice and and not that i want cops thinking twice when they're doing their job you know like i but like it seems unfair to stick taxpayers with the bill for police misconduct. So I think there's there's a couple points sort of to, in either direction, and I don't I'm I'm not actually going to clearly say yes or no. I'm gonna you know make no, that, that was a direction. philosophical yeah yeah. Um, from the standpoint of that you're making of you know asking an individual officer to pay um that settlement you know would it create more personal accountability? Yes. However, asking the department to pay it may create more systemic accountability because they're not going to want the liability of that office of, of people who are okay. regularly making misconduct. So that may create more systemic change. And I don't know which is, you know, which is the better route to take, or if maybe it's a cost sharing kind of, you know, deal. Cause I, like, I think about like, um, other, like I have to carry malpractice insurance. Like if I do harm and someone sues me, like well, uh, cops are citizens as well. They are also um part of the taxpayer base, you know, right. Um, you know, so I think if, if we ask individual officers to do it, in all likelihood, there would be like a new malpractice insurance kind of system set up. Like I pay, you know, whatever, hundred dollars, few hundred dollars every year to have malpractice insurance. So if I get sued, I it doesn't come right. out of my pocket. Right. Um, but so so I don't know exactly what the best answer <laughs> is, you know. Me I either. But I do think there are, there are pros and cons to sort of either path forward and, and thinking, you know, systemically, if, if you hold the department accountable, will they create better hiring and training practices to, to protect themselves? Mm. Question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for thinking about it. I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to ask Zuckerman that when I get him on in November here. Um, you know... I got a couple other random ones, but I think this is a really nice place to wrap it. Maybe we could follow up on this at some point. This has been really lovely, Tanya. I, I appreciate your time so much, and it's been a pleasure meeting you. And uh, I always leave the last word for my guests. So um, if you got anything else, this is all you, Tanya. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I just want to say thank you for for having me and just giving me, a, you know, giving us the opportunity to just talk through this stuff. I think that, you know, it's really great to sort of have those well, the well-rounded conversations around like the larger structures. So frequently with the structure of our legislature, things get so siloed and it's like, okay, well, this is all we're talking about today, but we're not thinking about all of the ripple effects and those larger impacts of, you know, what does that actually mean? And so this was just really nice, well-rounded um, conversation. Over that A little all over the place, but you know, I'm kind of like that. It was fine, though. Like, it was so grounded in in just really the way that I approach this work from a systems perspective. It's the way that I approach social work. It's the way that I approach policies is really looking at these bigger picture systems. And so I just really appreciate getting a chance to, to have this conversation today. Me too. It's been a pleasure, Tanya. And, and best of luck uh, in the coming months here.
Thank you. For real. I hope we can talk again soon. Take care. Yeah, you as well.